Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. This is our webinar, uh, Encrypt Sensitive Data While Preserving Platform Functionality. Before we get started, this is our Safe Harbor slide. I'm sure you've seen it before. Uh, but in case you haven't, it simply states, uh, please make your um, no purchasing decisions based on any forward-looking statements that we make today. Uh, we will be making a couple of forward-looking statements, so just be aware of that. Uh, and bear that in mind uh, as we go forward. My name is Peter Chittam. I'm a developer evangelist here at Salesforce. And uh, you can follow my activities on Twitter, at P. Chittam. You can also check out any code, anything that I produce, uh, at my GitHub repo, uh, which is github.com slash P. Chittam. Uh, we are a transcontinental presentation. Uh, I'm in the UK, and joining me across an ocean and a continent is Asaf Ben-Gur. Hi, everybody. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me today. Uh, so you want to int introduce yourself, Asaf, and uh, talk a little bit about what you do? Yep. Uh, so uh, my name is Asaf Ben-Gur, and I'm the product manager for the new native platform encryption solution that we've been building for the last 12 months or so. Uh, before joining Salesforce, I've been a customer myself uh, and also worked for a Salesforce consulting firm. So my big goal here is to build something that will be as seamless as possible to your uh, business users, to end users, but also for administrator and, admi and developers. And this is what all about this... Uh, all this webinar is about. Peter? Excellent. And Asaf is really the expert in encryption and, uh, and in the feature. Uh, I'm the developer who came along, got interested, and got this uh, webinar going. Uh, it's been really good experience for me because I've, I've uh, actually learned a few things about uh, encryption that I haven't learned before. Uh, so when we get to the architecture section, uh, that's where Asaf is going to step in because uh, I can say AES 256-bit AES encryption in CBC mode with random IV, but I don't really quite understand all of that, so that's why Asaf is here today. All right. Uh, we are a social business, and we live in the world of social media. Um, as such, please follow us on all of our social channels. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar today, please use the hash force webinar hashtag. This webinar will be recorded, so anything you miss, don't worry about it. It will go up onto our YouTube channel and be available via the registration URL within a couple of days. The question and answer section is available, so don't wait to the end to ask your question. Please do respect the Q&A etiquette. Repeating the question over and over again 10 times isn't going to get it answered any faster. We have a small number of people trying to help us out with those questions today. Uh, but be patient with them, please. Stick around for the live Q&A at the end. Asaf and I will answer some of the more pertinent and more interesting questions at that time. And if you, something comes to mind that didn't occur to you during the webinar, don't worry about it. Head to our developer forums at developer.salesforce.com slash forums and ask your questions there and we'll get them answered for you. And that brings us to our agenda today. We'll do an overview of the platform encryption feature. Asaf will then talk about the platform encryption architecture. I'm going to go through setting up platform encryption, and then I'm going to go through some of the development and implementation features of platform encryption. And those last two sections are pretty much all demo. Uh, the first two parts are pretty much all talk. So be patient with us. We'll get some live stuff uh, uh, the second half of the webinar. So let's get started with our first section which is our overview of platform encryption. Now we wanted to put this into context. We've actually bundled up a set of features around compliance and security in your orgs, and we've called them Salesforce Shield. These are comprised of event monitoring, which allows you to watch for and look for certain events that have taken place in your system. The new field audit trail feature, which is an enhancement to the existing field history tracking feature. And of course, our topic today, platform encryption. I want to stress that any of these features are available as independent features or uh, bundled together as Salesforce Shield as well. So the platform encryption feature uh, has a couple of uh, key, uh, fe key features that, uh, that comprise it. First of all, we wanted a seamless uh, 
architecture on the platform to protect your data at rest in the database. Uh, we wanted to be able to encrypt standard and custom fields, files, and attachments. We wanted to um, integrate with native features such as search, chatter, and lookups. And uh, we also wanted to make sure that customers could manage their own key encryption lifecycle. It's important to stress that platform encryption isn't just uh, isn't uh, uh, the only security feature that you have available to you. Platform encryption doesn't replace or substitute for any of the other features that you're already using. So as far as getting into your org, you have identi Salesforce identity, authentication, and SSO. Two-factor two authentication is also available. Once your users are authenticated, profiles, permissions, sharing, and field level security all ensure that they only get to see the data that they're supposed to see. And of course, for auditing and compliance, things like our setup audit trail, field history tracking, tracking and event monitoring are all in place. So really, if you think about it, platform encryption is just one tool in a very large toolbox you have to secure your data on the Salesforce platform. It's worth highlighting a couple of really key use cases that we want to uh, have you think of when you're considering platform encryption. First of all, where you have some kind of regulatory compliance, uh, this is obviously an important use case where you might need to secure your data in the database at rest. You might have certain contractual obligations as well to your customers, and that's also important. Um, but fundamentally, platform encryption is really protection against unauthorized uh, access at the database level um, and to prevent loss of your data. It's also important to identify very clearly what platform encryption is not. As I've already said, this isn't a substitute for your sharing model or any of the security features that are enabled with your profile or permission set, such as object and field security. Uh, platform encryption isn't a data residency solution. If you need to solve a problem of data residency, this is not where you need to look. In addition to that, uh, you can't encrypt other non-Salesforce data. So if you have data in your own data center or in some other cloud service provider, uh, platform encryption on Salesforce and on force.com is not going to solve that problem for you. And uh, of course, if for some reason one of your users were to be socially engineered and someone got in a hold of their user credentials, platform encryption isn't going to solve that problem either. I thought it was really important just to reiterate that on the Trust website, trust.salesforce.com, if you take a look at the Learn link and look at best practices, there's a whole page with links to best practices that you should be following in your org anyway. So on that last point, I'd really like to suggest if you haven't checked out the Trust Best Practices page, uh, do so because you might prevent uh, some kind of data loss that platform encryption will never be able to help you with. All right, so I'm gonna go through a bunch of features and a bunch of the, uh, the key pieces of platform encryption over the next few slides here. Um, and just to kind of summarize, summarize these, uh, in the world of platform encryption, we have certain privileged users that have special access rights, so we'll go over those. Uh, I want to explain very clearly what it means to encrypt data at rest in the context of platform encryption uh, and have you, help you understand a little bit what that means in the context of encrypting your fields versus your files. You do get fairly granular control over, platform, uh, over your encrypted data, so let's take a look at how exactly that works. Uh, we'll also talk about key lifecycle ownership, uh, the configuration and maintenance, and how that's a point-and-click feature. Um, and then at the end here, we're going to take a look at API support. So those last two bullet points will really be part of our demos at the end. So as far as our privileged users in the world of platform encryption, platform encryption makes use of the legacy view encrypted data setting in your profile or in a permission set. Uh, so this is the same setting that allows you to, uh, to enable a privileged user for your classic encrypted text field. And it works pretty much the same way, where users with this permission turned on will view the encrypted data in clear text. Users without this permission will view a masked version of that data. Now there's another privileged user that has a permission called manage encryption keys. If you want to nominate a certain user or a set of users whose 
primary purpose in administration is to manage the key encryption lifecycle in your org, you can do this by creating a permission set and then assigning that permission set to those users or having a particular user profile. Um, and in doing so, then that user would get uh, some additional permissions to, to, uh, to rotate the keys. Okay, so what does it actually mean to encrypt at rest, to be really clear about this? The platform encryption service sits just above our actual database tier, and Asaf is going to go through a little bit more detail exactly how this works, uh, but we'll just treat it as kind of this, uh, this nebulous layer above the database for now. Uh, we have our users who might be adding data to the database, and regardless of your view encrypted data setting as a user, you, uh, if you have field permissions and object permissions, you will be able to store data in the database. So either of these users here could go in and uh, either update or set a value into this name field that's set as encrypted. The difference that they're going to encounter is when they go and try and read the data. Uh, and what you can see is the, the encryption service is taking that clear text data and encrypting it as it's being passed into the database. Uh, and the reverse is true as they're retrieving the data. So upon retrieval, the encryption service decrypts that data and then it goes out to the end users. If I don't have view encrypted data, this is where I'm going to see the text mask. Now for file encryption, this is a little bit different. There is no privileged access to your encrypted files when you're using platform encryption. Uh, every user who's authenticated on the Salesforce platform will be able to access encrypted files. Uh, so here with file encryption, we're really talking purely an encryption at rest solution uh, with no distinction between user read permissions. Um, so uh, again, the encryption service, it's the same service, but in this instance, it sits above our uh, file system service. Uh, the user saves a particular file, the encryption service encrypts it, and then when it's accessed again, it decrypts it and displays that. Uh, now, as far as controlling encrypted fields, the field encryption is very granular. I can enable or disable any of the, sorted, any of the supported field types, so things like text, text area long, email, and a few other text-based custom uh, field types are supported. Uh, and there are some standard fields, too. If you look at the upper right-hand side of this slide, you can see that these fields here, like account name, contact name and several other contact fields are all encryptable with the encryption service. And you can see it's as simple as ticking a box on that particular field to enable encryption for that field. You can enable the file encryption independently from enabling encrypted fields. So if I decide to have encrypted files in my org, I can do so by ticking a box when I enable or when I, in the same page that I use to rotate my keys. However, for files, this is an all or nothing service. So what you can see is I tick the box for en enable encrypted files and attachments, and from that point forward, any files that I save in my org will be encrypted. Uh, it's a little bit small here, but if I zoom in, hopefully you guys can see uh, that when a file is encrypted, <coughs> it is marked so on the file detail page in my org. So let's talk a little bit about the encryption key itself, and then uh, uh, pretty soon I'm going to pass it off to Asaf to cover the, uh, the architecture. The encryption key is made up of two parts, and I like to use an analogy of a safe deposit box when I'm talking to people about this. So when I go to my safe deposit box in my bank, I own one key, and I'm the master of that key. There's another key that the bank will have. And in order to actually get access to the contents of that box, I need to have both keys. It's kind of similar the way that the encryption key works, uh, except it, think about it as if I open the box, I actually just get another key. Um, so on the Salesforce side, the, the master secret is what Salesforce owns, and we rotate this secret each release. Uh, it's then stored in our key derivation servers, the tenant secret is the secret that our customers will own, and they get to rotate as they decide, as they choose, up to once per day in their production orgs. Now, this key is itself encrypted and then stored in the database, and there, uh, there's actually, as, as part of the hardware security modules and the key derivation servers, uh, there's an additional key that's used to actually encrypt that. 
Uh, what I will say about the way that the keys work and the master and the tenant secret is that there is a white paper that's now available. Um, I'd strongly recommend reading that white paper if you are in security and if you need to understand in more detail how this works. In the end, the actual encryption key is derived from the master secret and the tenant secret. Um, and the way it would work is uh, when data is being persisted to the database, it's going to, the encryption service will look to see if a key exists for that data, uh, for that combination of tenant and master secret. And if it doesn't, it will go and generate the key at that time and then use it to encrypt the data. Um, and it will use it to encrypt data going forward until either the tenant secret or the master secret is rotated. The data encryption key is never stored in the database, which is what gives us an additional layer of security to prevent data loss uh, if the data center were to be compromised. Um, as far as features and support, uh, this feature is GA in Summer 15, but do be aware there's a feature license required. So if you do want this in your org or if you have a customer that's interested in this, do have them talk to their uh, account executive uh, in order to, to get this enabled. Um, I will mention, though, that developer edition orgs do have this enabled right now, um, but for accessing a developer edition org in the EMEA region, I'm going to give you some special instructions at the end of this webinar. The current support for platform features includes global search, lookups, workflow, approval processes, and validation rules. Uh, in addition to that, some, um, some features that are programmatic. So um, I'm going to pass this now to Asaf and have him go and uh, present about architecture. Thanks, Peter. I'm showing my screen now. So I'm going to go a little bit under the hood here and review the different building blocks and different layers that uh, we build the encryption into. Uh, not in too much details. Uh, for a more detailed process, again, you can uh, check out the detailed white paper that we published under our site. Uh, so if you're looking at the encryption service, basically we build the encryption as a service uh, solution into our application tier. So in the application servers are acting like a gateway, if you like. So they're like intercepting all the requests that's coming in from customers. Could be through the standard API, could be through desktop, mobile, uh, any request that's coming in. And it has to go through the, the application servers first for interception. Then, we, because it is a metadata-driven solution, now for the first time ever, uh, we can tell if a given data needs to be ended up with a field that marked as encrypted, or file needs to be ended up encrypted in our file system. Um, and it was all being done according to the encrypted bit that we added to the, uh, to the field property. Uh, we're doing the encryption and decryption uh, processes in the application tier in, in Java in runtime. It means that uh, it is completely transparent to customers and developers and admins. You don't need to write any custom code to do encrypt or decrypt code. It will just happen transparently uh, to your uh, business users. Uh, we are using AES encryption with 256-bit keys and CBC mode and random IV, which means that every time we encrypt the exact same plain text, we get totally different ciphertext. So if we we'll encrypt the, the name Peter 10 times, we get totally 10 different uh, ciphertext. And then we're going to store that in the, in the database. Uh, we call it like a full probabilistic encryption versus other deterministic encryption or tokenization techniques that are available out there in the market. But we took the approach to use to keep encryption strong, and yet, because it is being built natively into our platform, uh, we can get to preserve a lot of the core functionality uh, today and, again, keep encryption uh, strong. Um, the hardware security modules are actually composed of two components. One component is the master HSM, which is a Luna G5 USB key that is stored in a bank vault in a safe deposit box. And only a few named uh, security officers are authorized to step into the, uh, this bank vault and, and do whatever they need to do on a release basis. Uh, and the other component is the key derivation servers, which are uh, deployed out there in a cluster fashion in each and every data center out there uh, with an embedded HSM card, PCIe HSM card. 
We're using the master HSM. By the way, those two uh, components are FIPS 140-2 uh, compliant cards. So the hardware is FIPS 140-2 compliant. Uh, we're using the master HSM uh, USB key to generate the pair release keys and secrets, including the master secret, the master salt, uh, the tenant wrapping key, the master wrapping key, and some other uh, release identifiers that we use to do key derivation. Uh, then through the, uh, the source control mechanism, we distribute all those keys and secrets uh, through our source control, and then end, they all ended up in the key derivation servers cluster. So it is deployed in a, in a state, statelet, stateless fashion. So in theory, every HSM machine or every key derivation server can encrypt or decrypt any data that, that uh, uh, goes through them. Um, the key derivation servers, again, are deployed in a cluster fashion. Uh, in each and every data center, and we're using them in order to uh, generate secrets. For example, the tenant secret uh, are, secrets are generated in the embedded HSM card. The tenant secret is an org-specific 256-bit uh, key that we generate on the HSM card, and can be only wrapped and unwrapped in the embedded HSM. Uh, and we're using them also to derive keys. So. Uh, we're not using the tenant secret to encrypt the customer data or the master secret, but a combination of the master secret, which is a perilous secret that we, Salesforce, we own and rotate on a release basis, together with the, uh, with the tenant secret and some other release identifiers and org identifiers go through the PBKDF2, the password-based key derivation function, uh, and after 15,000 iterations, it generates or derive the, the data encryption key, the symmetric key that we use to encrypt and decrypt the customer data. Then after it is being derived in the key derivation servers, it is being uh, shared securely or sent securely back to the application server. And then the application server uh, store it in the, in the local cache for use for encryption and decryption. So uh, it allows us to, because we're we're keeping the uh, record of the master secret together with the tenant secret. The tenant secret is uh, in the generated in the uh, key derivation server embedded HSM card and then encrypted and stored, encrypted in the database. We can generate and derive the data encryption key that the application server needs anytime we want. So um, if you're looking at the key derivation process, it allows us to generate it any time. So if the key, if the data encryption key or the derived key is not found in the application server cache, the application server will just authenticate securely to the key derivation server together with the encrypted tenant secret and some other org identifiers and ask the key derivation server to derive the, the key version that it needs for encryption or decryption. At any given time, uh, every org can have only one active encryption key that used for encryption, but n other decryption keys. So when customers will do uh, key rotation and they'll generate new tenant secret that Peter will show you in a bit in the demo, or us doing the key rotation of the master secret, it doesn't impact uh, your existing data or existing uh, decryption keys. Um, the data encryption keys, those derived keys that, that, that are used for encryption and decryption are never persisted on our end. The only thing that we stored on disk is the org specific tenant secret, which is encrypted and can be only unwrapped in the key derivation server embedded HSM, only there. So the key derivation, the derived keys are stored uh, in memory in the application tier and used by the application. If we look at the, at the process of encryption, so the first step will be, you know, any, any request that will be coming in through the application server that, again, will act as a gateway. This is happening regardless platform encryption. So it could be a standard API call. It could be a desktop coming in from mobile or, or any call. We'll go first through the application server 
and we build the encryption service into that. The application server will intercept the request that's coming in and say, hey, uh, uh, the, the first name and last name or maybe the account name are marked as encrypted. This data needs to be ended up in, encrypted in the database. I need to get the key, the old specific key, to encrypt this data. So the application server will look in memory and search for the old specific key it needs to encrypt this specific specific data. If it's there, it will use it, encrypt the data in Java, and then store it securely in the file system and in the database. But if it's not there, it will um, it will uh, start up an HMAC uh, call and authenticate securely to the key division server together with the encrypted tenant secret that's stored in the database with some other uh, metadata that we keep there, and then we'll ask the key derivation server to derive the key version that it needs, and then send it securely back to the application mm -hmm. server. The application server will use it, encrypt the data, and then store it securely into the, the database and file system. The decryption process is fairly similar. Uh, think about your user. Uh, think about uh, a business user that is authorized to read encrypted field values in plain text, right? You granted him the view encrypted data and he wants to look at the report, a visual force page, maybe an API call or any other request. Uh, the application server will say, uh, will fetch the data that it needs from the from the database or file system and according to the metadata we have on field level and, some, and the uh, properties and metadata that we keep in the in the value headers, we can tell that the, da that the data is encrypted and using which key. Then again, the application server will search in memory, search for the key version it needs. If it's not there, authenticate securely to the key, the key derivation server, ask it to derive the key. We will exchange it, uh, send it back securely to the application server, uh, decrypt the data and send it back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the end user. Uh, so if you're looking at the different building blocks and layers, we build it in a way that no single wall can get access to both keys or encrypted data altogether. So think about the Salesforce DBA uh, with access to the database. They don't have access to the application server. So through segregation of duties, we get to a point that whoever has access to the key derivation servers or maybe to the, to the safety deposit box or to the application server don't have all the um, all the puzzle uh, pieces just to, you know, to, uh, to connect the dots. Uh, we are fully operational in all the data centers today, meaning all the, the key derivation servers or the cluster of key derivation servers are deployed across all data centers but London. London is underway and we're expecting to have that uh, be available later on this year. Um, so, in theory, again, every such cluster can serve any encrypt or decrypt request that will come in, but for performance reasons, obviously, uh, we set it up that every data center or every cluster will serve its own tenants in the, in the data center. Uh, the key derivation servers are not one per customer or one per org. It is a shared model, so every encryption server can serve uh, an number of tenants that needs encryption and decryption uh, and derivation processes. Uh, Peter? Yeah, excellent. Um, thanks very much, Asaf. And uh, um, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed reading the white paper and, uh, and I especially liked the, um, uh, you know, the description of how the keys are derived. For me, who, who, you know, who is not a um, an encryption professional or security professional, uh, the impression I got was Russian dolls, really. <laughs> um, and it seemed like Russian dolls within Russian dolls within Russian dolls, in fact, uh, when you start to dig into what the different keys are, what they're responsible for, um, I, I, it was impressive to me. So hopefully some of the people on the webinar today who do have some background with encryption um, are also uh, feeling like they can trust this, uh, uh, this feature as well. Um, cool. So let's jump into setting up platform encryption. And um, one of the things I wanted to accomplish this, with this webinar was to, to demonstrate and to show just how easy this is to set up. 
uh, one of the advantages, just with, uh, just the same as with many of the other features on our platform, uh, making something that's point and click easy to set up is something that's always of value to our customers. So I thought I'd take a, a completely blank org except for a custom object and just show everybody um, what it takes to actually set up encryption. Um, so I'm just going to jump right over to my uh, environment here and there we go. <laughs> so uh, this org here uh, is an org I set up today and I have a single custom object called note in it and under security controls at the bottom you can see that there is the platform encryption functionality. Uh, so we're going to go there to set this up. And this is what you see in the platform encryption uh, page when you first arrive here in setup. It's simply uh, a button to create a tenant secret. Basically, without that tenant secret, you're you're missing the you know the 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 customer owned piece of the puzzle in order to actually do the encryption. So uh, creating your first tenant secret is what turns this on in your org um, once the feature has been provisioned. And so once I've clicked on that you can see that I'm, I'm presented with a slightly different screen here. I see at the bottom my current active key and at this point in time I can't actually click on generate new tenant secret again. I have to wait 24 hours before I can do that. Um, I can certainly export my key and there is really good reason to do that. Backing up your key gives you uh, the security of knowing that should your key be lost because you can't actually destroy inactive keys you can always restore that. Um, now you can see up above here where I can go and enable my encrypted standard fields. I can also specify whether or not I want to encrypt files and attachments. So we'll go ahead and select that and set preferences. And we'll take a look at the encrypted standard fields. This is the same UI I showed you in the screenshot earlier. So if I want my contact name click on edit first. If I want my contact name to be encrypted and I also want email address to be encrypted, um, I can do that quite easily and turn that on. So now as I save data into my contact, uh, those fields will be encrypted. Uh, now you notice it says enablement pending, right? So <clears throat> there is a process that goes on in the background to turn this on just as is the case with many of the features uh, where you, you click a box, you turn it on, and then there's a little bit of a background process that needs, that's needed to finish that. Um, so we update the UI right away for you. Now likewise, I also have this custom object called Notes. So here is my Notes tab. And no thank you for my tour of the app. I'll click on New, and you can see that there's a note name, uh, there's my date, and then there's a, there's a summary field. So if I was taking notes that might be some kind of sensitive information, um, I might want to go and enable that. Um, so I'll go and jump into the fields of my custom note object. And if I go and take a look at my custom fields and take a look at my summary long text area here, I can then edit that. And you'll see that there is a tick box that has popped up that says encrypted, encrypt contents of this field. And I simply need to tick that box just like I did with the standard fields. Click on save. And again, a uh, background process will go through and finish that up. Uh, but fundamentally, I now have data that is encrypted uh, in, my, in my org. Now, likewise, if I go and upload files, those will be encrypted as well. So all those features are now enabled and ready to go. Um, now, just to wrap it up and uh, cover off my privileged users. So I'll go in, and uh, this is the user I'm currently logged in as, Maxwell Smart. So we'll select that. And of course, he is a system administrator. Being a system administrator, This user will have the manage, um, uh, go and create. 
There we go, the manage encryption keys setting. So that's enabled for my system administrator. Um, and as typical, the system administrator does not have the view encrypted text setting. So normally that's turned off for my administrator. Okay. There we go. So there are, there's my, um, uh, there's my, uh, pr my privileged user settings. Uh, I've gone in, I've created my key, uh, my first key. Uh, I've enabled it for some standard fields, I've enabled it for my files, and I've enabled it for my fields. And if I, um, uh, for, this, uh, for this part here, I'm not going to bother actually showing the data. I have some encrypted data in my other org that I'm going to use when I start to talk about some programmatic features. Um, I literally just wanted to show, you know, what was that, less than five minutes, and I have my org ready to go to store encrypted data. Okay, so quickly jumping over to platform encryption and development. <coughs> there is a custom object, uh, sorry, a custom object, a standard Salesforce object that's been added to your org called tenant secret when you use platform encryption. The tenant secret object is, is where your tenant secret is stored. Um, it is API enabled, as are all of your encrypted text fields. So I'll show uh, a little bit, mostly I'm going to show access to the tenant secret object, uh, but we can also take a look at how uh, the data is accessed as well. In addition to that, I'm going to show some functionality with SOSL. Um, <coughs> I'm going to uh, show a little bit of a use case around how to solve sorting. Um, with the type of encryption that we're doing, doing an order by in the SOSL is pretty much impossible. Um, so of course you can still solve that problem by doing something with an APEX. And finally, I'll wrap up by showing a solution with uh, Visual Force and Apex and doing key rotation. All right, so let me go in here to Workbench. And the first thing I want to do is jump into uh, my REST Explorer to take a look at some object describe functionality. Um, and actually, let me take a step back. <laughs> I missed one little key piece here, which is this use case. So um, based, I, I'm based in the UK. I'm originally not from here. But one of the features of the NHS that we have is something called health visitors. Um, now, health visitors are specialized nurses that go around and they visit new mothers and their children. Um, and they can actually stay in touch with you um, up until about your child's fifth birthday. So in the UK, storing personally identifying information, or PII for children, is something that is extremely sensitive. That's something that I've even run into running events for children, working in, my sales, in some of the Salesforce Foundation events that I've worked in. So it seemed to me that a good use case to demonstrate with this would be a health visitor. I'm a health visitor. I'm going. Uh, I'm making house calls and talking to, to mothers and to fathers. And, taking a look at their children. So any of that information, including the children's names, possibly information about the, the parents, their NHS numbers, um, all that information, and, and notes, of course, that I might be taking for these visits, um, all of those things are potentially very sensitive information. So what I have here is my health visitor app. And of course, the kind of key object is children. If I jump in and take a look at my schema builder, you can actually see the schema that I've built, where I have the contact representing the parent. Child is a custom object. Um, each time a health visitor makes a visit or is visited, they can make, take notes in the visit object here. And sometimes when you have a visit, the, the parent might inquire about some childhood program that they might want to participate in. And if so, you can make a referral, and that's what the referral object is just to sort of flesh out the use case a little bit. Um, in the child object here, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. <laughs> I have encrypted the NHS number for the child, and I've also encrypted the child's family name. So those are the two things that I've encrypted in this object. In the visit object, uh, I've encrypted notes taken about the child, and then sometimes there may be notes about the parent, um, so if they notice that the parent maybe is feeling unwell uh, or is maybe having difficulty, they may want to take notes um, about that as well. So those are two encrypted fields. Um, and one of the things I thought I'd show really quickly was right off the bat the support in the global search here. Um, so if I go and take a look at, and I'm, I'm just through a blank, 
on my uh, my search term that I was gonna, that I put in there. Um, play groups is what it is. I'll do a search, and you can see here that uh, each of these visit records <coughs> has a comment here about the parent being interested in playgroups for their children. And just to illustrate this, and obviously a text mask is not the same uh, as actually encrypting data, uh, if I go and take a look at this from the standpoint of a user that doesn't have view encrypted data, you can see here that they're showing up with the uh, text mask there. Um, so again, just to, to, to indicate that uh, that, that uh, is actually being encrypted, um, through the user interface, you can kind of get a look at that. Um, and this was something that was really missing that we never had in the previous encrypted text fields functionality. So I think it's good to see that. Um, now, one of the things I thought would be interesting as well uh, is we actually have a little feature that Asaf imported, uh, which is a SOCL search. Uh, and if I go out here to, uh, sorry, a SOCL search. So if I just look for Switzer, and it looks like I'm having a problem with my actual Sossel. Uh, I was making some adjustments to this, and I'm really worried I broke it. Um, so that's probably my fault. But I will go through uh, the, the sorting feature that, uh, that we built and you can take a look at that. Um, so let me actually jump in and take a look at that right away. So if we take a look uh, at my actual SOSL page here, uh, what this is is a page that's going through and it's doing a search. Um, it's looking for accounts, contacts, and opportunities. Uh, now there are no standard encrypted text fields in opportunity, uh, but there is an account and contact. Um, when we click on that, it's going to go and invoke the action called SOSL Demo Methods. So let's take a look at that. So SOSL Demo Method um, is going in, and it's actually performing a SOSL search here. Um, you can see it's searching in all fields, and we're returning account, contact, um, and opportunity. Okay. Now, the important thing is that we can't actually do the order by. So in order to do that, there's a dynamic sort feature called sort list. And you can see here that in my account list, in my contact list, um, <coughs> we're passing this through this sort list feature. Um, and essentially what this does is it uses a little bit of Apex. There's my dynamic sort. Um, to go through to collect up all of the values of a certain type, uh, it then does a sort on a list of the keys, um, and then it reconstructs that list as a result. Um, so just to show a workaround in code where the actual platform encryption feature cannot deliver the functionality for the sort, the sort order, um, you can do so in Apex. So going back here, uh, another feature I wanted to show was actually doing the encryption. Now, uh, sorry, rotating the actual encryption key. So if I go in and take a look here, let's try that again, there we go. Um, I went and built a little tool here called Rotate Secret. It's just a Visual Force page. And the Visual Force page simply goes and gets the current active secret. And you can see that I rotated that yesterday afternoon. Um, and it also gets the immediate previous secret. So I can do a comparison. I can see how recently have I rotated this secret. Um, and in this page, I have a button called New Key. Um, and all I need to do is click that button. And it goes in and it rotates the key. Um, <coughs> So I can see there it's been active. It was wrote, updated from my Visual Force page. So let's take a look at how that works. So this page is called Tenant Secret Manager. Uh, there's not that much interesting in the actual Visual Force itself. Uh, I'm simply using this extension called Tenant Secret Extension. Uh, and the button is executing a method, where are you, called Rotate Key. Now Rotate Key does a fairly simple operation. As I said, the tenant secret S object is the S object that stores the tenant secret information. 
Um, you can see here in my description, uh, it's just new secret from Visual Force page. That was what showed up in the actual user interface here. So new secret from Visual Force page. And then I simply um, insert that new secret. Um, once I've done that, uh, it just refreshes the page and I go and refetch the, the most recent two secrets so I can see those again. So it's a fairly simple operation to rotate the secret. I'm just using DML. Uh, I insert a new tenant secret and then the rest of it takes care of itself. The actual generation of the key is not something I need to worry about as a developer. Um, I don't need to worry about encrypting the key before storing it in the database. Uh, all of that is taken care of for me. Okay, and uh, the last thing I want to do was take a quick look at this from the perspective of the API. So going back to the workbench here, um, what I'm going to do is actually use the composite feature. There's a composite request feature that's been added recently. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> and using this, I can actually make a batch request. In other words, um, I can go through and I can make two requests at once. Uh, so what I'm going to do is do one request that's going to attempt to rotate the secret. Um, and that's not going to work. It's going to fail to disorg because I just did that. Um, and then it's going to retrieve the most current secret as well. So let me go and grab that JSON. All right. So let me expand this so we can take a look at what it's doing. Uh, the, let me, a little bit further, there we go. So the batch request simply allows me to do two REST requests in one single REST request. The first one is a post, um, and I'm posting to the tenant secret S object. In there, I have my description, right? So similar to what I did in my Visual Force page. Um, and I just set that description value on the post. So that'll do the insert. Again, that should come back as a failure. Um, and then after that, I'm going to go and do a get request. So here I'm doing a query. And you can see that the fields, the description is the same description field that I had up above. Um, status, version, and secret value. Um, and created data I thought would be interesting fields to select. So my status will be either active or inactive. Um, my version will be the number, the, the, it's just an, inter, um, uh, an incremented number each time I rotate my key. And then the secret value is actually the, is the encrypted key. Um, so if I go and execute this, there we go, my results. It does have an error, right? So the one result is an error. The limit exceeded error is actually what you're going to get if you attempt to rotate the key a second time within the 24-hour period. Um, so just be aware of that. If you, look, if you need to look to handle exceptions, um, that's what the exception error message is. Now the result is still going to return all of the keys. So I can see each of the keys here um, is returned. And I think I did an order by, yep, descending. So I can see uh, each of the keys in the history of this particular org being returned as part of that. Um, so that tenant secret object is where I'm going to be doing the management of my, um, uh, of my, of my uh, tenant secret. All right, so let's wrap up here. So a few considerations. Uh, there are some limitations as far as what we support, uh, things like sharing rules, uh, person accounts, um, SOCL list filters, um, sorry, SOCL and list filters, formula fields, uh, and communities and portals. There are a few others. I would strongly recommend you read fully the documentation before you go and implement this. Um, and if you have existing integrations, because of the nature of your encrypted field, um, this may be affected. So be aware of that before you go and roll this out. Um, Asaf is going to talk about the roadmap. Uh, thanks, Peter. So as for the roadmap, we're going to invest in uh, three areas, basically, in each and every release onward. Uh, the first bucket is support and expanded the, uh, encryption into other standard custom field types and other content that customers are willing to encrypt. Uh, things like the person account standard fields, the name, and other standard fields that are stored under the contact entity. Things like case subject, description, case comments, text area custom field, and eventually things like shadow conversation, email to case correspondence, you know, whatever stored persisted uh, on disk on our end. 
Um, second, the second bucket is making the platform uh, even smaller, right? So we want to make sure that uh, the other features that are not supported today are encryption aware and they respect not only encryption but also the masking that is happening in the presentation there. So we're working closely with the search team to make the search on encrypted fields to be available through the Salesforce One mobile devices as well, uh, as well as support for communities. Uh, the third bucket is building more additional uh, key fe features to uh, let customers to take more role in the chain of custody. So we're, we're thinking to build a solution that will allow customers to generate their own org specific tenant secrets on-prem. They can use some, uh, uh, they can do that programmatically, they can use some third party, maybe uh, some, some teaming with the, the other gateway solutions out there to do that and then share it, upload it securely to our platform and then we will use that, unwrap that in the HSM card and derive the key off of this tenant secret that generated on-prem. Uh, the, the rule of thumb here is that the, those tenant secrets, uh, encrypted or not, has to be visible to our application servers because the encryption and decryption is happening in one time. So we're not going to invest in something that uh, we will need to do a, a web service call out to the customer premises and asking for a key and leave the database connection open. So the keys will have to be visible uh, to the application servers at all times. Peter, over to you. Yeah, so we have a list of resources here uh, um, that we are going to post with the slides, so I'm not going to go these in, into these in detail. Um, a couple of things I will draw attention to, again, uh, do check out the release notes from Summer of 15. Uh, if you need to get the detailed technical overview of platform encryption, check out the white paper that Asaf and I have both mentioned. Um, if you need information and details about the tenant secret uh, object, check out the SOAP API developer guide. Um, just like all objects, it is available there, and you can find out which fields are writable, which fields are not, et cetera. Um, uh, one thing that uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so I didn't show it, but in the actual metadata for your custom object, uh, there is uh, information about uh, which fields are encrypted, so that is deployable, of course. Um, and uh, finally, check out the Summer 15 webinar and demo, which is about 15 minutes long. So these are just a list and we will have active links available on the actual webinar webpage um, and with these slides when we post them. Hey Peter, can yeah. I share my screen really quick, just one minute to show the social demo and the dynamic sort in Apex, just real quick. Yeah, sure. I think it's important enough to show customers that they have some custom solution that they can implement on this area. Okay, so let me pass it over um, to you. Basically, the thing is that when you do full probabilistic encryption, uh, you cannot you cannot preserve things like alphabetical sort because you don't have a correlation between the ciphertext to say this is first, this is second, this is third. And because we build in crypto service into the application tier, you know any call to the to the database uh, asking to do some logic on the data will fail. So basically, what I'm showing now, and I'm just sharing my screen, I believe. I uh, just an Apex, uh, a Visual Force code that I use, uh, I downloaded from the developer community to do so so. And I have the account uh, name encrypted together with some driving license number and contact name encrypted. And using social and find, I can search for data programmatically, search for encrypted fields programmatically versus uh, the limitation we have today with SOCAL and where clauses, which is not uh, supported today. So I'll just look for the word Oriel, for example, and we can see that we get those results back. The account name, I have three records with, uh, with the Oriel uh, term in it, and we see that it is sorted. So the alphabetical sort is not supported in, in the standard functionality like reports or rela related lists uh, or list views or even the order by. But if you're 
if you spin up Visual Force page anyway, and you want to preserve such functionality, and you know you don't have like you know thousands of thousands of records, I think the limit for Sossel is like 20,000 records, and for Sockel, I think it's 50,000. Uh, you can definitely do the sorting in win in one time and get it sorted. So just FYI on that. Peter, over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, I don't know what happened with that demo. My apologies. Uh, it was working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but of course, as is always the case, something seems to have gone wrong. Yeah, it's the nature uh, of live demos, right? That's right. That's the that's the glory of that. So just to wrap up a few things really quickly here. Um, so these are just uh, just a few last uh, words of advice. I think as I was learning about this, uh, a, a few things came to mind that I think are probably maybe obvious, but worth saying anyway. And the first one is, of course, read the docs. And I've said this already, but I can't say this enough. There there are enough moving parts on this. Um, especially when you roll this out to an existing org, um, that you, you're really going to want to understand the full reach of what platform encryption is doing, how it works, and what the impact is going to be, both on your end users and on any, in, any integrations that you have. So make sure you check that out. In addition to that, plan, of course. Uh, you know, it's all well and good understanding what the impact is going to do, but then you want to plan your rollout so that you have uh, a minimal... Uh, disruption to your end users experience. And finally, back up your secret. I've said this already, um, but if you lose that and if it gets removed, uh, that's it. You can, uh, you don't, you lose any data that's encrypted with that, um, with that secret. Uh, now, a note to people in the EMEA region. I mentioned this earlier and we, uh, Asaf mentioned this which is that currently the EMEA data center and the EU5 instance doesn't have the platform encryption hardware in place. Now, that's still fine if you are in EMEA. The easy way to get a, an org, a developer edition org that is not in EMEA, is simply choose the United States as your country. That's what I did to get my developer edition orgs working. It will work for you as well. So go to developer.salesforce.com slash sign up choose the US in the country field, fill in all the rest of the fields as you would normally, and you can begin to play with this today. All right, um, at the bottom of this slide, you can see the link to the actual code, and I will figure out why my, my Sossil search broke, um, and I will we'll, uh, recommit that code up there, um, be hopefully before uh, the tomorrow. Um, and are there any questions? Yeah, uh, we have a ton, Peter. Uh, I will start with a, with a couple. I don't know how much uh, time we have. Uh, I think the most important one, like, uh, what's the difference between encryption, you know, in transit versus at rest? So let's, let's make it clear. The data is encrypted in transit regardless. Okay, regardless platform encryption, uh, the platform encryption, you know, between your end users and, and our environment, the data is encrypted uh, in flight. Uh, the platform encryption is only a solution to cases where, like, what happens to my data when it is persisted on disk, when it is saved persistently in the, on disk in the database or file system. This is where platform encryption com comes into play. So we differentiate between the two. Um, the other question we had is on FIPS. Like, so uh, uh, again, we we need to clarify that FIPS is only relevant to the hardware cards. It's by the way the SafeNet hardware cards. Uh, only the hardware is FIPS compliant, but we're not using uh, crypto libraries that are FIPS compliant. We're using PKCS. Uh, in terms of uh, availability, so as Peter mentioned, it is open for everybody in developer orgs. If you're based in the EMEA region, you need to choose the United States uh, country for now. Uh, and that's just until the end of the year, really. So. Right, right. We're going to have it uh, uh, operation, uh, fully operational uh, later on this year. And for additional fee in EE, in Enterprise Edition and above. And remember, if you don't need encryption, if you don't need to encrypt, it, uh, to encrypt your data, you don't need to encrypt your data. Okay, just yet another level of protection and security that some uh, uh, organizations that are coming from a heavy regulated, regulated industries are sometimes seeking to add. Okay, you but know, if you I'll, don't I'll need add, encryption... I'll add a little anecdote to that. I was speaking to somebody in our Customer for Life organization and he, he shared a story with me of uh, a large organization that was 
uh, they were they were beating down the door for encryption. And then when, once they had actually gone through the discovery and understood how the other security features worked on the platform, they actually changed their mind and they said, actually, you know, we don't need encryption. Um, so it is, I, you know, just to to add a little bit of a, an of anecdotal um, uh, background to that, make sure that this is really what you want before you roll it out. Yeah. Another question that came in is like, what happens to my existing data when I apply encryption on fields and files? So the answer is that the existing data is not impacted today when you apply encryption on existing fields and files. Uh, but newly saved data or new data that we'll be getting to those data elements will end up encrypted at rest. Um, you know, as an interim solution, you can use data loader to just uh, touch all the all record IDs and have the crypto service to kick in and get them encrypted. But then again, you know, areas like field history cannot be touched and updated. So we have some uh, background uh, service that uh, we're working on to make it externalized to customers so they can opt in to a service that will do all the mass encrypt process for them. And eventually we're going to use this background job service to allow you to rotate your existing data and get that mass decrypted using the, the old key and get re-encrypted using the new key that you will, you will be adding. But it's something that will be coming up in our roadmap, Safe Harbor. Uh, when you rotate your key, nothing happens to your existing data unless you go and destroy the key. If you destroy the key, even at Salesforce, we cannot back up your data. So the very first thing that you want to do, you know, as a best practice, you generate the very first secret, then export it and save a copy of it uh, on-prem. Uh, nothing happens to the data. It means that it will still be readable. Okay, just encrypted using another key. And remember that because we're storing metadata on the keys and on the field, of field values, we know the application server knows which key it needs in order to encrypt or decrypt. Uh, any other interesting questions, Peter, you see on your end? Uh, so I just have the Q&A screen up right now. Um, yeah, I, can... So I, can, I can pick another about performance. Yeah. Performance is an interesting topic because questions that are coming up uh, pretty often is like how does it impact the performance? Uh, if, if at all. So yes, it impacts performance pretty, pretty negligible because we're doing it all natively here. Um, but uh, we do add, you know, the encrypt and decrypt tasks into the transaction. So sure, we, the, there is some perf impact. Again, negligible and it depends in, in four or so parameters. First is what is the data volume? that you're doing. So if you're, it's your business user that's running a report or list view or, or account record or visual force page, it will be really negligible. Uh, but if it's an integration user that's loading now uh, hundreds of thousands of records, you should be expecting some larger uh, perf impact there. Uh, the second parameter is whether the keys, the org specific keys, those symmetric keys that we derive, whether they are cached in the application server or not. And again, whether they are cached in the key derivation server or not, and whether we need to do a key derivation to derive those keys. So these are basically the four uh, parameters, and obviously the, the network latency that it varies between organization. Uh, Peter? Yeah, so um, let's see. I got the, I got the uh, spreadsheet up here. Yeah. So why don't you take another one, and I'll see if I can pick one out that okay. looks uh, so Another one that, uh, that comes pretty often from customer call, like, how often do we need to actually rotate my, uh, our keys, right? So there is no, you know, there's no one's truth here or one policy. I know that PCI has, like, uh, 12 or 24 months or something like that that they, that they require, but uh, I can't remember on top of my, my mind, but it varies between organizations, so it's part of our best article, best practices article that we publish into Help and Training, and it's available for you today. Uh, one of the things is, you know, to sit down and think about your key rotation strategy and, and data backup. Okay, you need to, to decide, like, what's your strategy? What are you going to do with existing data? Are you going to rotate the keys? Are you going to do a data rotation following that? And how often do you want to do that? You don't want it to go and just set up your your key, you know, set and forget and live with this key for the next five or ten years. 
you don't want to do that. And, and we do have some stats that, you know, customers are using our legacy encrypted custom solution, the classic encryption solution, that they're still using the key that they generated years ago. Um, so there's a question on what does tenant secret mean? Um, I hope that that was answered in the presentation. Um, uh, but just to reiterate, the tenant secret is the, the part of the, uh, the encryption material that is owned by the customer. And, and by, by having two pieces of that, it's what allows you, the customer, to actually own that key uh, derivation lifecycle, right? And did you answer the question about um, does Salesforce have access to customer keys? Did you uh, address that one at all? I didn't. I went through that in the in the slide. So basically, you know, full segregation of duties. We got to a point where you know no single role can get access to both encrypted data and the keys, all the key derivation servers, all the safety deposit box box in the bank vault all together. Uh, we don't have access to the keys, and you know, if you go and destroy the key, uh, destroy the tenant secret, we we don't have a way to back it up. Yeah, and if if we if we did have a way, then we wouldn't have really built this the way that we we said, right? So yes. it's, it's one of the things that I try and highlight to people is um, the fact that you know you can actually destroy your own key. It it, it highlights that the, the security that we that we put in place. Yeah, and we could have you know we could have built the encryption service into the database and say, hey, all the database is now encrypted and all your data is encrypted, including dates and currencies and everything just works. But at the end of the day, you know, we couldn't give any any control over the key lifecycle to customers, right? And then we were at a risk where you know Salesforce DBAs would have root access to the database and they could see the data. So this is why we ended up with building the crypto service natively into the the app tier, and then the app is actually the gatekeeper, making sure that only authorized users that are associated with a given org can actually read the data, read the encrypted data. Great. Well, I think um, probably we should wrap up. We're about 10 minutes over. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has come on the call today. Uh, thanks for very good questions. Um, and thank you, Asaf, for, uh, for helping us put this webinar together. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, and uh, just, to, just to let people know uh, and to reiterate, the recording of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel, so do check that out after a couple of days. If you go back to the registration page for the webinar, you'll actually find a link to that YouTube uh, recording. You'll also find a link to the slides. We're going to make those available as well. And finally, we'll also put online a list of all the questions that were asked along with their answers to, uh, to, to, to make sure that all of that information is available and accessible after the webinar. Uh, we do have a survey, so please, please go fill out this survey. Um, I'll leave this up here for a second. Uh, we'll also send you an email and follow up to complete the survey. We do want to know how we did, uh, apart from my SOSL demo not working. Uh, and, uh, and we always want to make sure that we get good feedback so that we know that we're providing the right topics to you, that we're pro providing the right contents, and if there's anything that we can do to improve, we need to know that as well. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, hope you have a good day or a good evening, wherever you are.